Good afternoon. I am Ben Reed. I am the Division Director at uh, NASA's Exploration and In-Space Services Division out at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, I am pleased to be speaking with you today about some of the activities that are happening um, at Goddard um, and some of the uh, long-term plans that NASA has to that will will need um, on-orbit servicing uh, capabilities to accomplish. Here we uh, is the methodology we follow in deciding what technologies to work on. We, we start with the mission type on the far right. What types of missions uh, is NASA interested in pursuing or considering pursuing? Um, uh, uh, human exploration of the moon, um, uh, cooperatively uh, uh, servicing large observatories, one day building large telescopes large enough to search for life on another planet, um, you know, what capabilities are needed to make those missions uh, come to reality, uh, the five R's that I mentioned before, um, uh, as well as others there in the middle. Um, and then we figure out what technologies are necessary to uh, produce those capabilities so we can actually execute the missions. Um, so this is the process we follow. You can see on the left-hand side of the screen the uh, uh, technologies that we are presently working on. Um, uh, advanced avionics, in-space dexterous robotics, specialized tools, uh, fluid transfer. Um, and through this work, with, uh, we have learned that there are uh, a, a set of cooperative servicing aids which make satellites much more uh, friendly servicing uh, partners in orbit. So we've developed a series of cooperative servicing uh, um, um, aids that uh, we are working on and I will, I will talk about that further on in the package. So what, what is our history? I mentioned uh, Hubble servicing. You see the, those missions there in the, uh, the bottom row and the middle row uh, on this chart leading to, uh, in the beginning of, of the last decade, uh, the robotic refueling missions. Um, and all of these are culminating with a large uh, a mission which we are presently undertaking to bring a suite of on-orbit servicing capabilities to operational status, and that is the OSAM-1 mission, which I will talk about in, in detail. So this is a, a good example of some of the modular components that uh, were uh, used in the Hubble servicing missions. You can see on the, on the left there uh, an astronaut whose feet are attached to the end of a robotic arm um, holding a, uh, a modular uh, scientific instrument. Uh, that instrument was neighborhood of six or seven hundred pounds. Um, needed optical uh, precision alignment when installed. Um, and when installed it only required two uh, bolts to be tightened. Uh, to both secure it in place and uh, establish that uh, the optical alignment necessary to collect um, uh, measurements so that we can unlock the secrets of the universe. Um, you see some tools there that the astronaut is holding in the, in the middle and then on the right uh, example of astronauts inside uh, the telescope getting ready to uh, replace uh, components for the uh, spacecraft bus itself. Hubble is the proof of concept for servicing both in the area of unplanned repair. Of course, when Hubble launched, we all know the story of how um, uh, the primary mirror um, was the wrong figure. It still is, um, but we were able to, with unplanned repair, overcome this and still take uh, clear images. And then, of course, on the right is an example of how a uh, planned upgrade of scientific instruments um, allowed us to uh, uh, take images of the Eagle Nebula first with the with pic 2 camera on the left in the visible wavelength and then subsequently with the wide field camera 3 um, as technology advanced on the ground we were able to take advantage of that on orbit um, uh, and so that the, the image we see on the right there of that same Eagle Nebula in the infrared. So fabulous proof of concept the Hubble Space Telescope, which allowed us here on chart eight 
to see um, uh, these fabulous images that uh, it's been able to take. And after uh, 30 years, Hubble is still uh, in, its, in its prime. So what investments do we presently have up on space station? Uh, we've got Raven, which is a, uh, a demonstrator of the ability to autonomously track and determine six degree of freedom pose for uh, all the visiting vehicles coming to space station. This autonomous tracking technologies are, is necessary for missions like OSAM-1 um, so that it can um, uh, find and track uh, uh, its client uh, 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 for rendezvousing and capturing it for servicing. RRM-3 is presently on space station. That's where we are developing technologies for cryogenic fluid transfer. Um, and we also have on space station right now um, two uh, robotic external leak locators housed outside so that um, um, uh, should the space station need to track down an, a, a leak in any critical fluids, um, that they would have the ability to, to do so with that robotic tool on orbit. So here is our, um, the main mission within the division. Um, it is to conduct a, a technology demonstration of autonomous rendezvous, uh, capture and refueling of the Landsat 7 satellite. It is not a rescue mission, it's a technology uh, demonstration mission. Um, you can see the, the main steps there uh, across the middle of the chart. Um, and while all the while this is uh, ongoing, uh, we are actively transferring technology to uh, other uh, sectors within NASA to other space sectors within the U.S. government, um, as well as to U.S. industry. And I will talk more about our tech transfer uh, program uh, further on in the, in the package. So here is a, the, the, the concept of operations for rendezvousing and capturing Landsat 7. Our robotic servicer uh, has uh, two arms um, and a series of tools on its payload deck. Here we see the arm reaching down to pick up the first tool, which is a gripper tool, which is going to grasp a component on the back end of Landsat 7. And here you see the gripper tool uh, being uh, placed into the right position. Um, we actively move uh, the servicing satellite or translate it up close to Landsat 7. Um, first contact will be made by the gripper tool at the end of the robotic arm. You see that arm about to be extended out. Uh, when it gets into the right location about the Marmon ring, um, it will autonomously close its jaws. So all this is autonomous. Um, now from the ground, we command uh, the two vehicles to be berthed together. Um, and now you see the arm is available now that it has uh, 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 positioned Landsat 7 on top of three berthing posts that robotic arm is available um, to pick up the next tool and we can start that phase of the mission, which is um, uh, the refueling portion. Here we see uh, the, the robotic arm has picked up a specialized wire cutter tool, which is cutting the lock wire to free the cap in the center. This is a fueling cap, never designed to be accessed in orbit but we are using our sophisticated robotic tools to remove that cap um, and pick up a, a refueling tool. Um, and so this, of course, an operator did on the ground before it launched. And for the first time, we will be demonstrating uh, that we can refuel a, a, a satellite in orbit uh, that wasn't designed to be refueled in orbit. So this makes every satellite presently in orbit, a potential client for on-orbit refueling. Um, so here is how the, we access that fuel valve, and you can see the simulation there of hydrazine being provided to the client, and the refueling tool is then uh, retracted. So very, very quick uh, overview of the concept for in-space uh, refueling. Now, with this mission, you see the, the title of the chart, the title of this mission is OSAM-1. Uh, o stands for on-orbit, the S is servicing, and you just saw that. 
autonomous rendezvous and capture, and then refueling of Landsat 7. The A stands for in-space assembly, uh, and the M for in-space manufacturing. I will show you what the in-space assembly is going to involve. So on the side of the OSAM-1 vehicle, we are launching seven hexagonal reflector segments, and here you see a third robotic arm assembling those reflector segments into a nice uh, parabolic dish, a, a, an RF antenna, 25 square meter KA antenna, and we will then communicate through that. So we will demonstrate in-space assembly of a antenna. We will also demonstrate in-space manufacturing. So here you see this gold box on the side um, is a box called MakerSat and it is going to use pultrusion manufacturing to produce a 10 meter beam. We will then uh, show that we can remove and replace that MakerSat uh, experiment on the side of the, restore, of the OSAM-1 uh, servicing vehicle. Um, and the, both the assembly and the manufacturing are being conducted with our industry partner, uh, Maxar Technologies. Um, so we are very proud to have both servicing, assembly, and manufacturing technologies uh, being demonstrated on orbit with this mission. So as you can see, through servicing, satellites are accessible um, and can be more cost effective. So uh, here you see uh, a servicing spectrum that we have developed advising satellite manufacturers how they can modify their satellites with uh, cooperative servicing aids. And in particular, I'd like to focus on the third column, second from the top, a cooperative fluid port. That cooperative fueling port we have developed, it's called the cooperative servicing valve, and it has a very cooperative robotic interface which allows much simpler both fueling on the ground as well as refueling in orbit. So this is a technology we've developed We've did specifically designed it so that it is very easy to be accommodated by new satellites um, as a direct one-for-one -one swap for their uh, traditional fueling valve, um, but it's much easier to be refueled uh, in orbit. Moving on to the Immortal Spaceship. The Immortal Spaceship is a concept where persistent platforms like the International Space Station you could imagine over time if each segment of the International Space Station was removed and replaced with a new one that the Space Station can remain there uh, almost indefinitely even though the components are upgraded with time. So that's the concept behind an immortal spaceship. And finally, uh, to, to uh, the NASA's long-term vision um, is to be able to build large telescopes uh, large enough that they can uh, directly image exoplanets. Now, why are we so interested in this? Well, we feel that this is a high probability that we could find signs of life on an exoplanet if we can look into their atmospheres. But to look into the atmosphere of an exoplanet surround, that is uh, orbiting a star um, outside of our solar system um, that requires very large observatory. So you can, you can get a sense that the technologies we've been developing one day hopefully will lead to the ability to manufacture a very, very large telescope like you see in this notional image here um, to look for life on, on other planets. So technology transfer, very quickly. We uh, develop technologies. We work with domestic industry uh, on what technologies they are interested in for their business plans so that we can generate a domestic competitive market for satellite servicing. We also infuse our technology directly to other government agencies so they can use them for their purposes and uh, other portions of, of NASA for their, for their missions that you see here on this chart. So besides individual technologies that are available to companies to transfer, we also have facilities that are available on a uh, Space Act agreement basis 
uh, for companies to get access to if uh, that would allow them to develop their technologies on a more uh, cost-effective basis. Here is where you can see we have an active outreach campaign to make sure that the technologies and the, the capabilities we are creating are available to the public. And I would encourage anyone interested in, in these activities to follow these links and in particular look online for our uh, Technology Transfer Day, which is um, coming up on September 22nd and 23rd. I encourage uh, companies to uh, register for that. There you see the link to the division. Um, I uh, am happy to be part of this webinar series today. And if there's any follow-up that anyone is interested in, of course, we'd be happy to, uh, to engage in that. Thank you for your attention.